Take a four. <clears throat> it's only 30 verses, but I've got two and a half pages of notes that I will run through as fast as I can, and that's just stopping at verse 18. So um, there's a lot to be said in this chapter, things to get down. Um, a lot of Galatians really, to me, is very simplistic, but chapter four has got something about it where I don't know, it just seems a lot of uh, deeper in, in some regards and some of the things. I mean, Paul will, uh, where my notes stop is at the beginning of 19, and Paul's dealing with the allegory of Ishmael and Isaac, and I mean, you could take down another six pages of notes looking uh, at the types and everything between Ishmael and Isaac, and I just, I know I'll be doing good just to make it to the end of this, what I've got wrote down tonight, so uh, if we have to, we'll pick back up there next week, or if the Lord permits and allows me to get through it fairly fast, that last section, we'll do it, and uh, give you a chance to study on your own some of the allegory of Ishmael and Isaac but uh, chapter 4 book of Galatians tonight Paul says now I say that the heir as long as he is a child differeth nothing from a servant though he be lord of all but is under tutors and governors until the appointed time of the father so we're going to look at the first two verses together tonight um, last week one of the things we was looking at was the law um, it was mentioned, Paul used it as, it was likened to our schoolmaster, um, and he said the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. We covered that briefly, um, and then here in chapter 4, he jumps in, and now he's, he's comparing the law and using us as heirs and, and using the word servant, and then he uses in verse 2 words like, uh, but is under tutors and governors, so the law is now, Paul is, Paul is giving types here if you're not getting that last week. The law was a schoolmaster. That was a type, something for us to look at as sort of an illustration. This week, he's dealing with tutors and governors. And so that would be, uh, you know, what we know as the Mosaic or the Leviticus law and things of that nature, rules and regulations. And I'm going to do my best to sort through my notes tonight uh, and try to make sense of all this. But God just poured a lot out to me. But um, Paul, Paul's dealing with this concept of the law being, like I said, last week our schoolmaster. And then in chapter 4, now he's referring to it like, uh, tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. We know what the time appointed of the Father was when God sent His only begotten Son. Whosoever believed in Him should not perish in, in Calvary. And uh, the 33 and a half years that Jesus was here, that would be the time appointed to where we don't have to be under the law anymore if we're saved. And we'll deal with that uh, in, in great, great depth tonight. Um, but I, I wanted to start you out with that, try to give you an understanding of what Paul's doing because Paul's. Uh, very good about shifting gears and maybe sometimes holding the same thought or the same topic in terms of the law and shifting gears in terms of a type or uh, another illustration. And so he says it's a governor or a tutor and he, he's, he's dealing with us being a servant and, and we're under uh, tutors and governors. And he'll go into verse 3 and say, even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. And so now we know that Paul's dealing with us as being heirs. He's, he's referring to us at, at one time being kids. And so you're kind of getting this concept of growing up. And uh, that, that's when, when you look at this, you're looking at, for one, Israel as a whole, the Jews as a whole, um, coming up and growing up under the law, under all that Leviticus law and Mosaic law. You're, you're looking at that as a whole. And then you can also, you know, there's, there's a lot of places in Scripture where, yeah, you may be looking at something doctrinally, but there's a good spiritual application or even... Uh, just, just, just a common truth, something that we all know, like growing up, because Paul's talking about when we were in, when we were children, and he's been dealing with rulers and governors, and we're kids, and we grow up, and, and that's sort of a lost art or a lost concept in this generation, just people growing up. We've got a bad, uh, bad, bad um, drought, if that's the word I need to use there. I don't really know what you call it, of people that just can't seem to grow up. They just, it, no matter... No matter what's done in life, no matter what happens, they just can't seem to grow up and uh, apply the basic concepts of life, of working, uh, paying your bills. And we're, we're seeing a, a bad sliding away of that where people don't want to grow up. And uh, when we're I'm getting a little off topic here tonight, but this is just one of the things God gave me, that, that that's a bad problem in this generation. And then that stuff was it's indoctrinated into lost people, and then lost people are now allowed to come in and, and affect the church in, in the ways of the neo neo-evangelical churches and modernistic churches and all that and letting them sort of bring their 
ideology and, and, and their roots and, and background in terms of how the church now has shifted and the way the church functions and the way the church acts and the way it operates. Now you see that even among believers. They don't want to grow up in the Lord. They don't want to do anything for God. They, they want to stay on the milk their whole life. If they're even eating much milk, they don't want to grow in the Word. They don't want to study. They don't want to be active. They don't want to be... I mean, it's just a problem all across the board, inside and outside of the church. And, uh, you know, you hear all these people say, well, I just... I don't like my job. Yeah, I mean, that, that's part of life. You're not going to like your job every day, but you've got to do it in order to survive. Now, I mean, I could go off on some political jazz there and most probably bore most of you to death, but uh, it's a known fact that our government has tried to make it so people can live off the government. That way they have the control, and that's where I'm going to leave that at. But us individually tonight as believers is where I want to shift gears and go with this about growing up in the Lord and wanting to study and wanting to pray and grow closer to God and, and, and find whatever it is he's called us to do and, and, and try to do that and be faithful to that and do whatever it, we can to, to, to execute whatever God gives us to do, whether it be handing out tracts, whether it be witnessing, whether it be anything, we should be willing to do that. But you are in an age and in a generation where people don't want to grow up. It's all fun and games, and if I feel like it, and if I don't feel like it, then I leave it alone. If I don't feel like it, I won't do it. If I feel like it, I may do it, and that that's not... We, we got to be careful with that attitude. It's, it's very easy mindset. I mean, I struggle with that just like anybody else. Of, I don't feel like it, or I'm not really up to it, or I just, I'd rather be doing something. That, that, that's kind of the way we've indoctrinated the youth over the last several years, and now you've seen that begin to creep up, and now we're in the generation that was indoctrinated like that, that has now become adults, and, and it just... As you know, every age ends in apostasy, and, and that's the way it goes. It always ends in apostasy, every age, and that's where we're headed. I mean, we're just, we're, we're slowly headed to our demise. I mean, this, this age, I believe, scripturally, prophetically, we are headed for the end of all ages where we will be raptured out of here. And you say, I don't believe that. Well, I don't know what to tell you other than study your Bible, but I'm just telling you we got a bad problem in this generation with people wanting to grow up, even in the lost and dying world and inside the church. And uh, I'm not talking about kidding and Joe. I'm, not, I'm talking about just growing in the Lord and in his word and studying. Like the Bible says, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. It's time to grow up and it's time to, 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 to chase after the things of the Lord. Seek after wisdom, like Solomon told us in Proverbs several times and even some over in the book of Ecclesiastes and uh, I mean just everything we read in the New Testament about seeking after God rightly dividing the word of truth studying to show ourselves approved I know I went over that Sunday night uh, and I, I don't aim to get hung up here again because I really got a lot of notes to cover but, but when you begin to take things out like we dealt with Sunday night about studying then you're, you're obviously beginning to indoctrinate some people that it's not even so much their fault in a lot of ways because that's what the Bible they carry around says and they don't know any different. And that's where you and I and other like-minded believers, that's where we come into play to show people uh, the, the, the wrongness of the modern perversions. And my wife was actually just doing that today with someone she knew. And uh, it, it always comes to a point. I, I, my, my biggest struggle in life is patience with people and, and things like that. I just want to be like, yeah, just blow it out your nose and go on down. That, that, is, my, that is my struggle today. I, I just, I get sick of the arguing and you show them scripture and they don't, I mean, it just, man, it just burns you out. And it's like, man, there's just so much more use of time it feels like you could be doing. But I just told her, I said, you know what, if whatever said at the end of the day, just recommend them a couple books, man. I mean, I got 51 reasons why back there. Jeremy's got a copy or two of it or maybe even more. You got, look what's, just simplistic books that are real easy and they're things you can check yourself. I know we're in the age of fact checking and that's why I, I, it amazes me how we're all about checking facts, but nobody will go check the facts on the most important book that has been ever given to mankind in the history of mankind. Nobody right. wants to fact check things surrounding that. They just, that's because we won't grow up. We won't yeah. grow up. We just yep. want to be fed by everybody else all the time and then feed us and then feed us. I mean, there, there's real good um, correlation or parallel, if you will, of, of the modern world and, and looking at people that don't want to grow up and don't they want to live off the go. There, there's a good correlation there to that in the modern churches today. It's all people wanting to be told. That's why, how, how, do, how does this, how, how has this church fallen off, the church age fallen off into apostasy? Because people just let anything go without ever looking themselves, without ever growing themselves, without ever growing up and saying, wait a minute, that's that's wrong. I mean, you, you take Martin Luther, uh, not, not not the garbage <coughs> pile. I mean, Martin Luther, the king of the Reformation, the, the, the one that started everything that inevitably where we're at today, 
He finally grew up one day. He got to reading the Bible and, and, and reading about faith, faith, faith. Man is justified by faith. Man is justified by faith. And he began to realize that that hellhole Catholic religion that he was involved in was not going to save him. That the sacraments, none of that was going to do it. And he finally stood up and said enough. The man grew up and, and, and began to study and, and, and find something that he could get a hold of and run with. And that's my encouragement to any Christian, young or old tonight. Get a hold of something God's give you and just run with it and go with it and study it and, and be vigilant in it. Be, be everything you need to be in it. But that's the concept tonight. Uh, I know that's kind of a weird rabbit trail going out of where we came from. But for whatever reason, that's what God had me pinned down because Paul's been addressing all oh, last week as a schoolmaster. This week as tutors and governors until the appointed time of the Father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of this world. Now, we have... Historic, historically here, we know what Paul's talking about, uh, the Jews being in bondage under the elements of the world and things of what we've been talking about, the law, the Mosaic law, the Levitical law, and all that. But you have good spiritual application here. You and I, when we were lost, we should be very aware of the kind of bondage we was in without the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Yeah. Amen. You, you should have a good remembrance of that. Not to sit and dwell on in terms of uh, to glorify sin, nor in terms of sit and dwell on, in terms of to beat yourself up, because if you were like me, you were just as worthless as they came, and God should send you off into hell a long time ago. The way I view myself when I was lost, I'm not talking about dwelling in that aspect. I'm talking about you should be able to look back and say, glory to God, that's what he delivered me from, that's what he saved me from, that's Amen. what he brought me out of, here's where he's put me now, and I'm glad, I'm sanctified, I'm saved, I'm set apart, I'm redeemed, I'm, I'm see all that stuff the Bible did, that you, you, you got to have a correlation there. We, we talked about that here a while back, about a, uh, that, that contact point of when you got saved and being able to look at your past and your old life and say, yeah, I'm not that way anymore. Yeah, I may still make a mistake. I may still mess up. I may lose my temper. I may you know, say something I shouldn't or, or, or do something I shouldn't. But, but it's not a habitual lifestyle like it used to be. And we should be able to look on that stuff and say, thank you, God, for, for delivering me from right. that, for saving my wretched soul Amen. and getting me out of that sort of mess. I mean, and, and that ought to also at the same time break our heart when we look at this world and look at people. I get just as mad and hot under the collar as anybody else in some of the stupidity going on. But at the same time, we're, we're, we, we get quick to forget Paul said, such were some of you, talking about us, the saved people. We used to be ignorant. We used to be, I mean, I'm still ignorant on a lot of things, but in terms of sin, I used to live in it, used to dwell in it, couldn't get enough of it, wanted more of it. Every bit of it I could get, I wanted, and we, we forget that sometimes, and that's why I'm always telling us, you know, don't, don't expect lost people to act like saved people. Now, yes, as I've always stated, I always will state, when they start messing with our kids, then I've got a problem with it. It's one thing right. to be lost right. and be wicked and be vile and be filthy and be unholy and all that. That's one, that's one thing. But when you start indoctrinating and perverting the minds of kids, you're stepping into a whole other realm besides an individual sin. Now, now you're beginning to tread on some very dangerous ground. I think the Lord Jesus Christ said it'd be better for a millstone to be tied about someone's neck and then to be drowned in the depths of the sea than for them to mess or harm one of these little children. I believe that's what the Lord said. Amen. 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 And so that's why I say we we, we got to be careful and we got to pay attention and we got to look at people and say, yeah, I know they're they're doing something that ain't right and it, it's it's wrong as all get out and it's not something they should be doing. But they're lost and, and you know I mean if you happen to say that about a saved person then you really got to dig in and, and and try to help them. But 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 lost people, man, they just they're just like I was when I was lost. Any, were any of y'all lost before you got saved? I sure hope so. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. I, mean, I mean, I didn't act right. I didn't do right. I drank. I smoked. I cussed. I doped. I did whatever I wanted to do without ever any thought about it because I didn't know any different. Yeah. Amen. 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 Now, I mean, I, I'm going to have to stick with my notes or I'm going to, but it, that's our job, church. Right. Those yep. that don't know, we are to tell them. Amen. Right. And yet you're in an age where people do not like the truth. Amen. 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 You're in an age where people do not like that book. They do not like the Lord Jesus Christ. They despise it. You say, well, it's always been like that. You don't know your Bible very well. It gets worse as the end gets near. Right. Right. It gets worse. Now, yeah, there's always been people that dislike the Bible. There's always been people that weren't a fan of the Lord Jesus Christ. But now you're transferring over, transferring over into a time and transition, transitioning into a time like never before other than as it was in the days of Noah, which Jesus warned us about. Amen and amen. amen. People despise God. They despise truth. They despise all this stuff. And that's why the modern church has to do what it has to do to be liked by everybody. Uh, but that's our job tonight is, is to, to, to warn people, to tell them about the gospel and to lift them up and show them the error of their way. Now, you may get yelled at and cussed at or spit at, whatever. Yeah, that, that may happen. But 
Brethren, we ain't in an age right now like some of the men of old that had bullets flying over their head and people shoving them off cliffs like the Wolf Engines and all, all the people. I mean, we don't know persecution today. And, and like I always say, it's always amazing to me how we've got it the easiest in America and yet the least gets done typically in terms of witnessing. You go over to China where they've got bullets flying over their head and they are the most zealous people you've ever seen in your life. I, I don't know what it is. I, I don't get it. I, I struggle with it myself in terms of, man, why don't I do more? God has blessed me. I mean, I got legs right now that I can walk on. Hey, man? Amen. I got hands. I got mountains. I mean, there's people laying on their back, and all they see is the ceiling 24 hours a day other than the eight hours they're asleep or whatever. God's been good to us. Amen. But it seems like the better we've got it, the less we want to do for God. And that's why, I don't know, that, that, that's a whole other study in itself. Uh, but there's a spiritual application here. When we were, when we were children... We're in bondage to the elements of the world. But uh, verse 4, Paul says, when the, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. Now this is really big stuff here. It may not seem like it when you read it, but this is very big stuff in terms of not only getting a good look at your Savior, but, but just sort of all, all kinds of aspects I'll deal with. But I, I want you to get tonight, your Bible, if you, if you really just calm down, it will define itself a lot of times. Right. Amen? Right. It, a lot of people don't know this, but the King James Bible has its own built-in dictionary a lot of times. It will end up redefining a word that doesn't make much sense later on down through the Scriptures. It's almost like God wants you to study. Yeah. <laughs> Amen? Right. It, it's almost like God wants you to read it. But but this is one of them deals because Paul talked about the fullness of time, uh, back, back or the appointed time of the Father in verse 2. And so you could be sitting around scratching your head verse 2. What is the appointed time of the Father? What is it? Well, <coughs> glory to God, hallelujah. You get to verse 5. Paul says what? Or, or verse 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law. So that's the time that Paul was addressing in verse 2. This is the most important time that has ever happened in the history of earth when the, the, the holy lamb of God came down to earth to be made sin, be made flesh, and I'll deal with all that here today, but so that he could die for our sins. This is the most important time you could ever find in the history of the, the world. Amen? Amen? It's the most important time ever. I mean, everybody's always wanting to research things about war and different things that happen in, in periods. And the most important time you could ever come to terms with is God sending his son to die for our sins. That's the most important Amen. time that you'll ever you'll ever find. But uh, the Lord comes down under the curse. You, you read that back, I mean, right here, we're using our Bible to redefine things. Back in uh, chapter 3, verse 10 and 13. Uh, Paul says in verse 10, For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. I mean, you've got some major self-defining going on with the scriptures here when you approach Verse 4, fullness of time has come. God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. You go back into chapter 3, you begin to see that, that Christ was made a curse because curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. I mean, I, I, there's so many, so much depth we could go here, but I'm trying to cover as much as I can. Uh, he, he, he took the servant or the slave's place in, in the yoke of bondage. I mean, he really did. Verse 4, the fullness of time has come. God sent it for this son, made of a woman, made under the law. That is Christ literally coming, and we'll deal with this a little bit further here, literally coming to take our place for something that we had been in bondage to for years. You say, well, I wasn't in bondage to it. Well, when you were born and, and, and you were lost and without God, you were in bondage to something and somebody at the same time if you didn't know it. These people that say, I'm not going to believe in God and I'm not going to get saved because I don't want anybody being over me, they don't know that someone is over them and they are in bondage amen, amen and amen but here you have a good clear-cut picture of the lord jesus christ being made a curse for you by him coming down in flesh being made of a woman and i want to deal with that but but i want to give you a few more things there he had to know the infirmities of the flesh you'll find that in hebrews 7 28 i'm not going to turn to all these because i got a lot of ground to cover but he had to know the infirmities of the flesh and he had to learn obedience. You read that in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Christ did everything you and I are subject and had to do except sin. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. He knew about infirmities. He knew about being obedient to the Father, being obedient to the law, rather more. He knew about obedience to God. He knew all about this stuff Paul's addressing in chapter 4. 
that you and I just could not do. We were, we were in bondage. We had that yoke. We had all these problems. We had that infirmity, but we could not do nothing for ourselves. And when you begin to correlate what we've dealt with the last three chapters of Galatians, where Paul's saying faith is how you're saved, not by works, and he keeps saying faith is how you're saved, not by works, that, that, that sort of ties that up for you. It should in your mind. Okay, yeah, I couldn't do nothing. I couldn't. I cannot do nothing to save myself. Right. I cannot do nothing to make myself presentable to God, right with God. I could not do something to get myself into heaven. There's a whole lot of churches, a whole lot of religion, religions today that still ain't figured this out. But I want to tell you, according to that book, you cannot do it yourself today. Right. You'll do it by the blood of Christ, or you will not do it at all tonight, and that's the end of it. If it's on you, if it's on me, I'm headed for hell. I'm still in my sins. There ain't nothing I can do for myself. Why would Christ come down and be made a curse, be made of a woman, bear what he did at Calvary, bear what he did at the Roman whipping post, bear all of that if you and I could do anything to get it? Right. Don't, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, amen? amen. I mean, that, that, that would make, uh, and I don't mean this irreverently, but that would just make God not very much of a God if that was the case. I'll send my only begotten son that I love and whom I'm well pleased to die for your sins. I'll look down from the windows of heaven, see him down at the Roman whipping post with a cat of nine tails, ripping slivers of hide out of his flesh, ripping his beard. The Bible says marred, marred beyond, beyond recognition, meaning you couldn't even hardly recognize him. He was so beaten. Then I'll let him drag that cross all the way up Calvary, the top of Golgotha's hill. I'll let him pierce his hands, pierce his feet, hang him up, leave him out there to die, and he thirsts, and they give him vinegar. I mean, all that. Why would God look down and then say, you know what? But if you think, Brother Ellis, you can make it on your own, I'll let you in. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. That's right. Yep. It completely, completely, and get this for the third time, completely takes the glory from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's right. right. If there's one thing I want to be about in this church, it's about the glorifying the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ Amen. and that he is perfect, yep. he is holy, yes. he is the Son of God, yes. he made payment for sins, I can't do it, but he did. Amen, amen. and amen. I get burned out on all these religions that think they're doing something to get them there because all you're doing is slandering the Lord Jesus Christ and to me, slapping God in the face. Preach it. Your sacrifice wasn't quite enough, Lord. i got to add a little something to it. I got no use for that stuff. Amen. And you will not find that in this book. Amen and amen, amen. and amen. Right. But he knew the infirmity. He, he had to know the infirmities of the flesh. That was Hebrews 7, 28. And he had uh, and, and learned obedience, Hebrews 5, 8. I mean, we read all the way back to one of the only accounts we have in, in Jesus' younger years would be at the age of 12 years old when he left Joseph and Mary and went to the temple. And he's in there telling them something about the word of God. Amen. amen. And they come to him and said, Jesus, what do you mean? I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but you know, I can't imagine... I've heard, I don't know what comedian it was, but it is funny to think about being Mary and Joseph, knowing you've lost the Son of God. He's, he's gotten out of sight. I mean, I'm sure they were they were nervous. But they find him. What, what are you doing? You know, we're worried, sick, whatever. And he says, don't you know I must be about my father's business? Amen. Twelve years old, he knew obedience. Yes. He, knew what he, he knew what he'd come to do. He knew what he'd been sent for. What about you? You know what God's called you to do? You doing what God's called you to do? Are you about the Father's business? Myself, your pastor and I, there's times I'm not about my Father's business as much as I should be. Does that help you admit that you're not either? <laughs> Amen? Yeah. There's times we're not, but I'm using this to encourage us tonight. Get us going tonight and lift us up a little. Uh, verse 4 or 5, look here. What, okay, why was he... Why was he made of a woman, made under the law? Your Bible defining itself, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So yeah, we're dealing with Jews that are under the law. I, I, I'm aware of that. But you can also spiritually apply this stuff to us tonight who are Gentiles who never knew anything about the Mosaic or the Levitical, Levitical law and, and understand that you, you were in bondage when you were lost. No matter how much you try to argue that, you were in bondage to someone and something or some things. Yep. You were in bondage. Amen right. and amen. amen. Why Why did he do all that? Verse 5, and he tells us. He, he came to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, uh, I, I read this earlier, and I, I copied this down. This, this was good. He wasn't merely made of a woman, like I said. That wasn't it. He wasn't just made of a woman. He was also made flesh. If you look over there in the book of John that I had Nikki make that deal and stick up on the window, it says he was he became flesh and dwelt among us. He was made flesh. Amen and amen. He was made to be sin. We read that in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He was made to be a curse in Galatians 3.13. We just read that. He was made a living spirit. We read that in 1 Corinthians 15.45 several weeks ago. He was made, he made us 
made unto us righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He wasn't just made of a woman. Yeah, Paul's given us a couple things here that are something he was made of. But I wanted to give you those after I read that for some encouragement. He was made a whole lot of things for us. Yeah. Amen, amen and amen. Yeah. You're talking about a, 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 a God part of the Trinity, who knew no sin, who was without guile, who was spotless, sinless, perfect, glorified, everything you could ever expect to be of a God, come down here, made of a woman, became sin, all that stuff for you. Yeah. Amen? Amen? For you. I mean, we, we Christians, we forget that sometimes. For you. Yep. For me. You do that for me, Lord? I mean, all these other people, they got to go around screaming a bunch of jihad stuff and blow themselves up for their God. you got a God that loves you so much he came down and died for you. Right. Amen. Left amen. his throne in yes. glory to die for your sins. Amen, right. amen and amen. amen. I mean, y'all ain't getting it tonight, I don't think. Yeah. He died for you tonight. Yes. Right. To redeem you. Yes. Yep. That, that, that's where we begin to forget stuff. He died to redeem you because you couldn't redeem yourself. Right. He died to yeah. save you from your sin because you couldn't save yourself tonight. Amen that's and right. amen. Yes. You would be hell bound, without hope, without God tonight, lost and dying alone in this world if he had not come down here and died for you. Right. We forget that stuff, but we, we, we need to remember that stuff. We need to say, Lord, thank you. Verse 5, to redeem that them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Uh, verse 6, he says, And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit. That Spirit is capital S in your Bible. When you see a capital S Spirit, I tell you this all the time, that's in reference to the Holy Ghost. Amen, amen. amen. Sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So, you I don't know about you, but I begin to read and see all the stuff that, that the Lord did for me, and that's the most exciting thing I can think about in my life. Amen. Amen. I'm, thank, I'm thankful Amen. for the day I got married. I'm thankful for the day that my, my children were born. I'm thankful for all that stuff. But the day I got born, <laughs> right, Amen. 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 I think about the Lord, and I ain't got to go to hell when I die, and I'm on my Amen. way to glory, and my wife's on her way to glory, and I got one kid on her way to glory, and another Amen. one that's on the brink of getting on his way to glory. I, that, that, that to me, there's nothing better tonight. Amen. That's right. Amen. There's nothing better tonight than knowing you ain't going to hell when you die Amen. and that you're going to get to go be around the one that loved you so much he came down and died for your sin. Amen. I mean, what, what, what in the world we got to be mad about tonight? I understand right. we go through trials. We have pro I, I get all that. I'm not, I'm not making light of anyone's situation. I'm just saying I'm trying to help you, encourage you. You're not going to hell when you died. Right. You're going to be around the King of Kings and the Lord yep. of Lords. And, and 16 billion years from now, what you're going through ain't going to amount to a hill of beans. That's right. Amen. 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 I gotta tell myself that a lot. I get to taking something small and making it make make it a mountain out of a molehill, like the old saying goes. And at the end of the day, what's it really matter? That's right. That's right. Eons from ain't that what the big bang dummies call it an eon? Eons from eons now. I ain't gonna be <laughs> brother. I ain't gonna be worried about something that didn't go my way. Yeah, right. Amen. Right. I'm gonna be up there around the throne praising Him that is holy, Him that is worthy. Amen, amen. and amen. amen. So that's just something to think about tonight. But, but then we get to verse 6, and he says, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Th this is reference to us receiving the Holy Ghost. Yeah. You, you understand Amen. God's done a lot for you tonight. Amen. Yeah. Amen. He said, I, I, I must needs go, but when I go, I will not leave you comfortless. That's right. And he says, When I go, I will send the Comforter to you, talking about the Holy Ghost. Yep. God loved you so much, not only did he come down and die for your sins, but then he said, I'm not going to leave you alone down there trying to hash everything out on your own and battle everything on your own and figure out everything on your own. I'm going to indwell you with the Holy Ghost of God to be a comfort to you, to be a convictor to you, to be all sorts of the, the, the jobs of the Holy Ghost. I mean, you can spend six months probably teaching on the different jobs of the Holy Ghost, but inevitably it is a comfort. When he convicts you, that should be a comfort. So really, comfort is the best blanket word or title you can give the Holy Ghost because everything he does is a comfort. Amen? Amen. Amen. You, you know why people don't read their Bible and interpret it right? Because they don't let the Holy Ghost of God give it to them. Right. They interpret it with their own self and what they want and their own will and their own way. But when God gives you something, brethren, it makes sense out of something you couldn't figure out, that's a comfort. That's right. That's right. And then when you get convicted over something and you get it on an altar and you get it right and God begins to take that away from you and you're free and clear of it, that's a comfort. Amen. It's, it's all, every, I mean, it's just the best name that could be given to the Holy Ghost would be the comforter in terms of something to help us understand one of his, his main job. But because we are gods tonight, we now have the Holy Ghost. Yep. Yeah. One thing you learn in your Bible, because this is a big deal and most people don't even know it or overlook it, one thing you learn in your Bible that separates us from men of old in the Old Testament 
before Jesus' sacrifice and before the day of Pentecost when the Comforter was sent was nobody ever got indwelt with the Holy Ghost all the time like we do. That's right. It would come on them for a little bit and it would come off of them. Amen? Amen. Is that Bible? Amen. That, this, Samson grew up and the Spirit began to move mightily on him in the camps of Dan when he was a young man. It would come on him, then it would come off. And you read yep. about Saul. Spirit would come on, Spirit would come off. It was always an on and off deal, but because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sacrifice, now you can have that continually. Amen? Right. Amen. Amen. That's why we're warned not to quench the Spirit because the Spirit's there continually where we are able to quench the Spirit if we get disobedient or whatever, whatever anything can quench Him. But that's why we're warned because we have it all the time. So I'm trying to align. I mean, we're getting close to Christmas, y'all, and everybody's all about these gifts. Why don't we start looking at the gifts of God? Amen. Right. Uh, Amen. The, the gift of, of sacrifice for your sins, the gift of the Holy Ghost, the gift of eternal life, all these gifts that He gives Amen. us. I mean, we, we are so infatuated and just so crazy and whacked out over all this stuff that we're going to get. And, and, and my kids are just like your kids. We buy them all this stuff and it's junk two weeks later. It's either <laughs> broken to pieces if you've got an Everett like I do, or it doesn't work. It quits working, or it's just junk, man. They, they pick it up, they play with it for a week, and then you don't see them touch it again for six months, if they ever touch it again. Right. Right. we got gifts here that are eternal. Right. Amen. Uh, things that last. I don't know about you. I'm sure I got burned out on gifts I got when I was a kid, just like you know, all other kids before. I mean, ain't no new thing under the sun. But there's one one gift I've never got burned out on. Amen. Amen. And that is the gift of eternal life from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. I've never Praise got God. bored with that. I've never got tired of that. I've never thought, you know what, I want to stick that on the shelf and go find something different. Not one time. Nope. Nope. Say. There's been times I've been low. I've been down in the dumps. Nope. I've been mad. I felt nope. like throwing in the towel for a moment. I felt nope. like punching somebody in the face, just to be honest with you. I've felt all kinds of things yep. since I've been saved. But I never thought, man, I'd like to take that gift of eternal life and throw it on the shelf and go find me nope. something because there's got to be something something better than what I've got out here not one time. Yeah. That's because I know in whom I believe Preach and it. that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day yeah. and that's because I know when I leave here brethren I'm going off into eternity yeah. and I will be there with God and I'll be there with God the Father God the Son, Amen. God the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I'm going to see lost love. I'm going to, brethren it's going to be things I can't even imagine. Why would I want to give that back? That's right. right. I don't, I don't want to do it tonight. Amen. There ain't nothing out here holding me down brethren. That's right. You say, well, what if the Buddhists are right? Well, they got one of the sorriest religions I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> what if the Muslims are right? I, you couldn't give me a nickel to be a Muslim. Amen. I ain't jumping behind some airplane and flying into a building and kill myself and a bunch of people I don't know. I got better things to do. <laughs> Amen. 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 That was Muslims. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's taboo in our society to call stuff out, but I'm good. I don't need that religion. Amen. 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 Well, what about reincarnation? <laughs> if you knew me like I knew me, I'm not going to gamble those dice of being come back as something based on what I was in my previous life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I didn't refer to that here a while back. Maybe some of these people, some of these idiots out here that believe that, I don't remember who it was. There's a lot of these celebrities that believe in reincarnation. You, 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 take, you take these women off the view. If they believe in reincarnation, they've got a bad reincarnate coming up ahead of them. <laughs> they're going to be like Roseanne Barr's toilet seat. Or something. That's what they're going to come back as. That's about all they're worth. Amen? Amen. So you mean awfully mean. No, they need to get saved. They do. Right. They're a poison and a pollution to people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's time, to, it's time to get right, brethren. It's time to call it out. And here's Amen. the deal. You couldn't give me a nickel to go try any other religion. That's right. Amen. You say, what about those people? What is God really going to send these people to hell that don't believe when they were raised this way? That's why we have missionaries. That's why people are going all over the, the, the world, coast to coast and shore to shore, everywhere to witness the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. People forget that. Amen? Amen? Why is that? I mean, have you ever ran into a Buddhist missionary? <coughs> Ain't that strange to you? I never thought about this until just now, honestly. You, you don't run, I mean, if they do, I don't know about it, but I've never, I mean, you run into JWs and Mormons and all them. That's a whole other subject for another time. But, but you don't really run into Muslim missionaries. No. They don't come over here to America and try to convert us that I'm aware of. They ain't never beat on me. I hope one of them never beats on my Lord. That'd be one scary outfit there, brethren. But nevertheless, I'm just telling you tonight, God's been good to us. Amen. God came down and was made flesh. God came down and died for our sins. And it wasn't enough for him. He said, you know what? On top of that, I'm going to give you the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right. I'm going to give you the comforter to help you and guide you Amen. and direct you and convict you and strengthen you and help you tonight. Amen. 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 And you couldn't give me nothing to go try something else. I've, I've studied a lot of those other things. It ain't nothing you want to go down. But if you want to, I mean, it's America. Amen. More power to you. I think the, the phrase I used to say, 
Uh, but I'm good tonight. I know in whom I believe, and I love him, and I'm satisfied, and I'm thankful tonight. Amen. I'm Amen. forever Amen. thankful. I don't always live up to it like I should. I ain't the best I can be all the time. I ain't the greatest. I ain't this. I ain't that. But I love him, and he saved me, Amen. and I'm going to heaven when I die, and I ain't worried about none of this other mess down here other than trying to rip some lost souls out with, with us Amen. to bring with us. Amen. 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 I don't even know where I left off there. Uh, <laughs> verse 7, I think. Yep. Yep. yep, verse 7. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So now we're not servants. Now, this is where you have to be careful with uh, some things because Paul says we're not a servant. And so some people, they, you know, they just, it doesn't click, oh, we're not supposed to serve God. That's not the type of servant Paul's talking about here. When, when you get like an 1828 No Answers Dictionary, you got a lot of different definitions of servant. And you have to look at context here. And Paul's saying you're not a servant anymore, especially when he's been dealing with the law. We're not a servant to the law anymore. Amen? Amen. Amen. And he doesn't turn around and say, you're a servant of God now, which that, there, there is a place where that, that is relative and that is real. But what Paul is trying to address right here in this particular spot of Galatians is you're not a servant to the law. Now you're a son of God. Right. Amen? Amen? We are servants. We do serve God. We should want to serve God. But that's why you got to be careful and say, oh, well, Paul's saying we're not servants. So that means we ain't. No, that's not what he's saying at all. He's talking about being a servant of the law, and you're no longer a servant anymore. Now you are a son of God. Amen and amen. 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 Uh, I'm going to, 1 through 6 here, here's your rundown. Verse 3, we were all in a mess. Verse 5, we all needed to be redeemed. Verse 6, you Gentiles got in on this too. Verse 7, therefore, you are the sons of God. That's all you need to know about the verse 6 verses. I know I said a lot, but that, that's inevitably the, the, the sum of it all. Yep. We all were in a mess. Amen. 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 I was in a mess before I got saved. You was in a mess before you got saved. We all needed to be redeemed. I needed to be redeemed. You needed to be redeemed. Us Gentiles, praise be to God. Amen. Amen. That's us. We got in on it too. And therefore now because we're saved, we're sons of God. Uh, and we'll we'll see that sort of again here, I think, uh, in verse 8. How be it then, no, it'll be on that here a little bit further. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. And so where this gets tough is Paul is definitely dealing with the Jews and being under the law. And I mean, you're going all the way back. Now, now we're looking at things referring to little g gods. Paul says, how be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. Now this definitely applies in a spiritual aspect and to us today in terms of there's a lot of little g gods out here in the world that people serve. Amen? Amen. Some of them's wrapped in a pig skin. Some of them's wrapped with a microphone. and a I mean, there's all kinds of little g gods. Some of them's wrapped in a green square with hundreds on it and fifties on it. Some of them's wrapped in everything. There's a lot of things you can make a god tonight, but given the context of Paul dealing with them being under the law, the Jews being under the law in times past, he's dealing with all the false gods that they worship. Amen? Yeah. That's what he's dealing with. And he, he, he makes it very clear. You did service when you knew not God. Ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. And so he's reminding them they're not even gods. Amen? All right. All right. They Amen. can't do nothing for you. It's good, to, it's good to, to quickly realize when you're serving something better and more deeper and more zealous than you are God, you're serving something that has done nothing for you. That's right. That's right. right. You really, you really, you say, well, no, I mean, you take someone that's greedy and their job and they serve that more than they serve God, it's done a lot for them. No, it ain't. It's all temporary. Yep. It's done nothing for them eternal. That, that, and, and I'll probably get to this. Hopefully we've got enough time. All these people that are willing to sacrifice everything they've got to go watch a bunch of people run down a football field in Kansas City all the time and spend every. And listen, if you go do that, that's between you and the Lord. I'm talking about the fanatics, and I will deal with this later, that do that stuff and they idolize these people. When I was a kid, I idolized Michael Jordan. I did. Y'all getting quiet. Y'all ain't never idolized something you shouldn't have. I literally thought Michael Jordan hung the moon when I was a boy. I love basketball, and that was during his, you know, some of his prime. I mean, I thought he was it, brethren. And you, and, and we, this is marketing. All this stuff plays into this stuff. And I know I'm kind of getting conspiracy, weird, whack job stuff on you, but listen to me. That that's the kind of stuff we do. I mean, I remember having posters of Michael Jordan all over my room. And then posters about God. And then, and I know we didn't grow up in a in a Christian home, and then some years later, praise God, my dad got saved, and now my mom's saved, and I'm, I mean, that all came later, but when I was a kid, 
It was about holding up a man or, or something or somebody and looking to them as the greatest thing ever. And and, and, and Michael Jordan never done one blessed fire thing for my eternity. That's right. right. Amen. Amen. And, and, and so he would be a little G God. If if, if I had a mindset today uh, towards basketball, and, and I know Michael Jordan's done past his prime and so on and so forth, but if, if he was still in his prime today and I had the same mindset, he would be a little G God to me because that's what I would spend all my time doing, watching him play. Watching reels, highlights, whatever I, I mean, just everything. That's where I would focus. I would be in the book. I wouldn't be at church. I wouldn't be, you know what I mean? Is this making sense tonight? Yeah. We, we, we make little G gods out of a lot of things and we devote all of our time to them. Some people make gods out of some of the craziest things you've ever seen. I mean, there's people that make gods out of, out of sex and things like that. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Get kind of quiet here, but that's just a fact of life. People make gods out of a lot of things, and Paul reminds you yeah. they're not even gods. By, yeah. by, by nature, they're not gods. Uh, when you And I'm going to kind of read 8 and 9 here together because he says, But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be unto bondage? And so this is a very profound question that the Apostle Paul asks. asks and he says, why, why, why do you turn it again to weak and beggarly elements? Why, why do you desire again to be in bondage. Why are you going back to that? That's the, been the problem with Galatia. Paul's been reminding them, faith, not works. Faith, not works. Faith, not the law. Faith, not the law. Amen? Amen. And he said, why do you even desire to do that? Now, uh, there, there's an interesting thing there, because Paul says in 8, when you do not God, then when you get down here in 9, he says, but now, after the that ye know, or, or that ye have known God, and I love what he says, or rather, are known of God. That, that's a big thing to me. I, right. I'm known of God. Amen. Now. He, uh, Hannah, was that Hannah that always sang that? He knows my name. That her singing that for a while? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I've heard a lot of people sing that, but he knows my name. That's kind of the same thing. You're known of God. He knows your name now. Yeah. Amen. Right. But you know what that tells you? When you're not his, you're not known of him. Yep. So all these dumb bunnies that say, well, we're all just God's children. And then, no, we're not. I get tired of hearing that. We're not all God's children. <laughs> when, when you're a little bitty kid and a baby and you don't know nothing about sin, yeah, yeah, you're a child of God then. But brethren, when you get old enough to start knowing about sin and how to be wicked, and now now you're made aware of that stuff, you're you're no longer a child of God. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. There, there, there's there's a gap there. I will give you that. You can scripturally and, and all day long begin to deal with that and prove that. But there's a time these twenty some year old people, thirty some year old people that are out here living like hell and blaspheme and got no use for God and they can't stand God and they despise everything about God. That's not a child of God. No, right. Yeah. It's not. And the world does this all the time. We're all God's children. We're all God's children. I'm a little bitty one. Yeah, I'll give you that. And those that are saved. Yeah. But those that are not saved, if we were all God's children, why would Paul be addressing the fact that you get adopted when you get saved? Yeah. Yeah. Right. That means you weren't a child. That means you had to be adopted. Amen. Amen. And amen. If, if, if we were all God's children, then why did Jesus tell the Pharisees, year of your father the devil? Yeah. He called the devil their father. Yeah. I'm just using scripture tonight, brethren. Right. Yeah. I think sometimes we get a, a bad, I don't know what it is, this effeminate type of culture we live in, we just want everyone to be included, and that's not the way it is. Until you get saved, you're not part of the family of God. You've not been adopted yet. Now, if a kid dies at a young age, and they're, they don't know nothing about sin and all that, I mean, I understand that age of accountability stuff. They'll go to heaven. I'm aware of all that. Where there is no law, sin is not imputed, is what the Scripture says. When they don't know any different, they don't know a blessed fire thing about nothing, that's different. Yep. But when you are aware of things, and you know things, and you're very aware that you're doing wrong, and that you're a sinner, and it's been made known unto you, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not a child of God anymore until you accept, you're not a child of God until you accept that. Yeah, and this world's right. got to get that. Well, we're all true. No, we're not. That's what Paul says. At one time, you knew not God. Then in verse 9, he says, but now, and it wasn't just, you, you didn't know God, but he knew you, because in verse 9, he says, but now, after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, now God knows you. Now, now you're one of his. He knows you. The Bible even says, and I forget which book it's in, uh, maybe Psalms, I, I don't remember. You can look this up, but it says that God's face is turned away from the wicked. Yeah. He doesn't hear them. Yeah. Amen? Amen. That, and, and like I said, it don't hurt to pray for people. It don't hurt for people to pray. I, I, I get all that. I understand people getting in a crisis and want God to do something that don't know God. But scripturally, you got enough stuff there to be like, oh, you don't really even hear those prayers. Right. When you were lost, your prayers don't get above this drop ceiling unless it's a prayer for him to save your soul and make you a new creature. Yeah. People right. have a hard time thinking. I mean, this stuff ain't popular in this generation. I, I know we all live in this church 
and we've God's been good to us. I'm not a good pastor. I'm not saying that, but God's been good to us in giving us doctrinal truth and truth out of the Scripture. But there's a whole lot of people today that don't get this stuff, right. and they just assume everybody's good and everything's included, and everybody's included and everything's good. It's all wonderful, and it's not that way. Right. And it's because they don't get in this book and they don't study and they don't see who God really is. Right. God loved you, died for you, gave himself for you, all that stuff, and he will have something to say if you do not accept that at Judgment Day. Right. It's not, I mean, so much stuff. I just, I'm trying, brother. I'm really trying tonight. But, but there's a lot of stuff here. Um, and then verse 8 also, he's dealing with false gods. You know, I just, I, I want to, because... Israel was bad about worshiping false gods. Amen? Yeah. They were. Every time uh, you get in like judges and kings and all that stuff, every time you get a king, he tear down all the high places and all the places they burn incense and all that stuff you read about, all, the, the places of worship, the groves, places, places where they worship false gods. Now, I could get real wacky on some of y'all. I don't know if y'all are ready for it or not, but I'm just going to tell you this. Paul could be referencing all the way back to the book of Genesis, back in chapter 6. Anybody ever study Genesis chapter 6? Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. But I'm telling you this right now. There were little g-gods here at one point. Yeah. Devil, demonic things. Amen? Amen. That's like aliens. I used to be so, so against the con. Now, let me finish this before you get up and walk out. I used to be so against the concept of aliens. And I'm still against the concept of life on other planets like we talk about but here's what I do know. There's some weird things of some demonic spirits that have passed through here and things that are going on, and that's a fact tonight. Right. Yep. Right. And you can stood, th This book will go a whole lot deeper than most people ever want, more than I even wanted to go with it until I finally just said, you know what, I've got I've to I've clear everything out of my mind here and just see what God's Word says. I hear somebody say something, I'm like, no, nah, I'm just going to discard that. I don't want to think about that. I don't even want to pretend. I don't even want to entertain that. And then I go read the Bible and go begin to study these things. I mean, well, yeah, well, that's kind of a hard one to explain. Has no one in here ever studied Genesis 6 or no. uh, like like the pyramids? Nobody ever studied the pyramids? You know what they teach? Uh, I, don't, I don't know all the definite things about the pyramids, but they teach that there was a civilization of people that built those. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah, giants. You think humans built those pyramids? Nope. Some of y'all out here thinking your pastor's going to lost his mind. <laughs> you should go study the pyramids. I mean in depth. And if you don't even want to really study, I can give you a movie on the pyramids and be enough just to make you chase a rabbit for six years. There's, there's, weird, there's demonic things that go on outside of this realm around us tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen? And I'm telling you right now, I could be wrong. I ain't got scripture to prove this. This is just Shane making a, <coughs> a, a wild, wild guess. But when the rapture comes, I begin looking at things like, well, how God's going to send a strong delusion to people who believe a lie. What is our nation so indoctrinated with all the time now? Yeah. Aliens, yeah. space, sci-fi, yeah. things of that nature. Yeah. I'm just telling you, it's going to get weird at some point. But I'd encourage you, go study Genesis chapter 6. I mean, really study it with an open mind. That's what I have to do. I'm a narrow-minded bigot, so I have to sometimes really tear the walls down and say, I want to know what those say of the Word of God, even if it trumps everything I've ever thought or any preconceived notion I ever had. I just want to, I want to do it. I mean, I've even got a little book back there. What's that book called, Jeremy? Something about UFOs or something? I can't even remember the name of it. Something about UFOs. It's just a little bitty book. It won't take you no time to read. I mean, very thought-provoking. And every bit of it is backed up and lined up with Scripture. And you say, well, yeah, even bad people... Uh, I know. I'm aware. I'm telling you to go study. But Paul's dealing with the concept of false gods. You ever wonder who all them Jews were worshiping and kept false? Where, where, where do people get these false gods from? Did they just conjure them up in their head? Or was there actually some demonic things going on back in Genesis chapter 6? Some false gods that were actually physically around here doing things. Uh, and and you, can't, you can't disprove what I'm saying right now. And you have to read Genesis chapter 6. And, and there were some weird things going on and things that I fully don't understand. But there was some real wacky things going on. So I'm just telling you, it'd be, be fun for you sometime to go study it and see what you think. You ain't, I mean, it ain't a big deal. It ain't heaven or hell type uh, doctrine here, but just something fun to go and, and check out. Uh, verse 10, he said, you observe days and months and times and years. I'm afraid of you, lest I bestowed upon you, you labor in vain. So, uh, I mean, I, I just wrote the question. <laughs> we know of any uh, religions today that observe days and times and months and years? Yeah, there's a, there's a few hundred or <laughs> better. I mean, there's a lot of people that do that, observe days and times and years. Uh, the unveiling of UFOs. 
Unveiling of UFOs. I know, I think I've got a copy of it back there. They may all be gone, but it's a real good book, real interesting. But there's days, times, and years. Paul is, Paul is dealing with this concept. Quit trying to go back into bondage. Amen? Amen. Amen. Next week in, in chapter 5, we'll, Paul will really lay the hammer down on something. But, but, but that is inevitably what you see through the course of Galatians. At some point or another, Paul says, look, quit trying to go back what God got you out of and what God saved you from. Quit doing it. It ain't going to save you, and it ain't going to help you tonight. It's just going to make it worse, and that's what he's telling them. And he says, I'm afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. He's saying, I don't want to do all this stuff in vain, man. Y'all get in. Y'all get serious. Serve God by faith. And don't expect that to save you. Don't go keep going back to the law. Don't be trying to circumcise everybody. I mean, that's been one of the topics we've dealt with. And Paul's like, enough's enough. Uh, let's jump into 12. 12. And that was what I wrote for 11. You want to go back to rules and regulations tonight? Eat your heart out. I got bad news for you. You can't do it. You want to go back and live in law, Levitical law? You want to go back and try to think you've worked your way into heaven? You're good enough and you're a good enough person that God... Has to has to let you into heaven. You want to go back to that? Eat your heart out, brethren. I wouldn't recommend it because you can't do it. And you're only going to put a yoke on you and a burden on you that you can't bear, and you're going to find yourself in worse shape. Only when we realize it's him and him alone are we really something that God can work with. Amen, amen. amen. and amen. When we get in our own selves and think we're doing something, we, we, we're just in the way, in my opinion. Uh, but verse 12, brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are, you have not injured me at all. So, I mean, I know the audacity of Paul telling someone to be like him, but he's trying to tell them to be like him in the aspect of this. I didn't go back to the law. I didn't go back to all the sacraments and the rules and regulations. I didn't go back to that stuff, and I'm doing just fine in the Lord. So be like me. You want, you want, you want an example, Galatia, all the churches in Galatia? You want someone to, to be an example here for you to, to get this through your head. Just do what I do, because I didn't go back to that stuff God saved me from. I didn't go back into the law. I didn't go back to the scribes and the Pharisees. I didn't do none of that stuff. I'm just enjoying the liberty of the Lord Jesus Christ, preaching the gospel, and going about everywhere God sends me. Be like me is what he says. Now, I know that uh, we got a lot of modernistics today. I mean, I, I'm going to try to not get on this too hard for the sake of my blood pressure. But we got all these people, and especially, especially women that make stabs at the Apostle Paul and say, well, the Apostle Paul, you know, he was just dealing with his culture when he said so-and-so. And when he wrote so-and-so, and the Apostle Paul, he was just a man. And, and it, it, these are from people that don't believe their Bible, number one. Amen. 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 And number two, it's people that are trying to justify something that Scripture says don't do by trying to say, well, Paul was a man, so therefore whatever he wrote down, it may not all be true. It comes back to not believing the book. Exactly. Amen. Amen. Uh, I, there was, I, I think it was Carl Wentz. I really tried to find that clip as, as hard as I could for you all when I did that. Had Nikki put together that big whatever it was where she showed all them clips I showed you. I've I, I seen it. I watched it. I couldn't tell you how many times. I was working for, for Cox Medical Home Support at this time. I remember it like it was yesterday, and I'm pretty sure it was Carl Lentz. He stated out of his mouth that if the Apostle Paul was here today, he would have probably rebuked him pretty sharp for some of the stuff he wrote down because it wasn't right. And I thought, buddy, you ain't got the sense God gave a brass monkey. That is the one God called to reach the Gentiles and let him write over half the New Testament. You ain't going to call nobody out. Yeah. And then some years later, Carl Lentz gets busted for cheating on his wife. You sit down and shut up, man. You go go back to daycare and let the grown ups talk for a while. You ain't gonna do nothing, amen. But it but it, it just people blow my mind when they look at Paul and they look at what God used him for. And he write, writes over half the New Testament and he is the apostle, the, the, the preacher to the Gentiles and they think that he got it wrong in a few places. No, God had his hand on that man because we were dealing with apostles, apostles, amen, amen. that have been called verbatim, firsthand by God. Amen. And that's the end of it. That's all you need to know about it. You say, well, I just can't believe Well, no, the problem is you got idiots like Joyce Meyer who don't know anything, who needs to just sit down and let somebody teach her for about 13 years that want to get up and say the stuff she does about the Bible and the apostles and try to correct them when she needs to be sitting down and be corrected. Amen. 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 If you're a Joyce Meyer fan in here, I'm just as sorry for you as you I can tonight. I wouldn't, oh, my, my Lord, heaven help us tonight. Amen. 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 You got trouble reading some of that scripture. I see Charlie firing at people today on Facebook. I went through there and just put little laugh faces like the creepy guy told me I am. I just put laugh faces. Get him, Charlie. I just sit back and watch you all fight. Amen. Amen. You ain't got to get in the middle of that. But, but nevertheless, Paul tells him to be like him. Hey, Galatians, you see me? Look, you see me running around 
taking a palm leaf home every Sunday it with, with ashes mashed on my forehead. You see me doing all that stuff? And I know I'm picking on the Catholics, but I can't help myself. It just feels so good. But listen to me. They're big sacramental people. They keep these, these commandments and these ordinances, and I think that's what saves them. That, that I'm putting this in layman today's term for you today. Hey, 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 little sock Baptist, you see me running back to the Catholic Church? putting ashes on the forehead and taking a palm leaf home and, and, and kissing the Pope's ring and taking of communion when it turns into, when it does its transubstantiation and it becomes the literal blood and body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I go, and brother, I can't help myself, but I go in that little box and there with Father Fondel and he forgives my sins and it's just so good. You see me running back to all that stuff? <laughs> now, I think I'll rest in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That, that stuff ain't going to save you and God help these Catholics. I hope they get saved. My problems with the higher ups, a lot of the laymen, the, the, the lower end people that just sit in it, they, they aren't aware because people won't tell them. Yep. Right. right. And it may upset people, but I'm going to tell people from this pulpit yeah. and if I meet them in person, I'm going to tell them I mean, me and Tim got to corner a priest one day right in front of the cab office. It's the greatest day <laughs> of my saved life. <laughs> the greatest day I ever had. He come, I don't even know what he's doing walking through there like that. I nudged him. I said, hey, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Let, let's go have a talk with him. And I just, I was nice, man. I just asked questions. And I'd say, so you think this? And you think, and you could tell it was starting to kind of frustrate him. It's like, man, you, you don't even really know why you believe what you believe. You have just been indoctrinated to think that if you do good and you're nice and you confess your sins to a man, to a man, yeah. the Pope yeah. is a man. Yeah. He's not the vicar of Christ like they call themselves. He's a man. And you think because you confess to these people and you take the palm leaf home and you smear these stupid ashes out of the fire pit you probably roasted hot dogs in the week before on your forehead and you take of this bread and this, this wine that you think is transubstantiated into the blood and body of the Lord Jesus. Just because you think you do all that, you get into heaven. That ain't going to get you into heaven. Right. You'll get in by his blood yep. and his sacrifice at Calvary and you putting your faith and trust in that and or you ain't getting in. Amen. Right. right. You, the Catholics are very, very, I, I don't want to say pretty, but everything they do has just got this rhythm to it. Yep. And it really looks good to an unknowing eye from the outside. It looks very, very presentable to the eye. It's all in order. And I, I mean, you ain't got kids like ours running around here 900 mile an hour screaming and whipping each other in the head with something. It ain't like that. It's very formal. And it's, I mean, but I'm brethren. I couldn't stay awake through that. I went to a mass one time when I was a kid and I can testify. I didn't stay awake. I, I fell asleep. The most boring thing I've ever been in my life. But it looks very pretty to the eye. But all of it is a bunch of hogwash blasphemy yep. that is going to send people to hell. That's the sad part. Because we got people that are always looking. If it looks good, if it feels good, if it makes me feel good, it ain't about that. Amen. 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 I better hurry. I, I'm, how bad is it? Y'all can vote me out if you got to. I, I try. I do my best. Uh, man, where did I leave off there? 13. 13. You know how through... Infirmity of the flesh, I preach the gospel unto you at first. Look, I'm going to go real fast here for a few verses. And my temptation, which was in my flesh, he despised not, nor rejected, but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. Uh, we'll stop there. Paul's dealing with his infirmity in his flesh, and he says it's a temptation. He was like, see, the apostle Paul was tempted to sin. When you start looking back at Corinthians, and Paul said he had a thorn in his flesh, <laughs> amen and amen, yeah. and he said he besought the Lord thrice, which means three times, to remove that thorn, and God said, no, but my grace is sufficient for thee. In thy weakness, my strength is made strong, I believe what it says, amen. Yeah. Paul is dealing with this same infirmity over here in Galatians. And he'll, he'll give us some inclination as to what it probably was. There's a lot of people that take different stabs at this, but I think it's hard to ignore what he says here in Galatians. But Paul's not dealing with a, a, a want to sin, an infirmity of I want to go sin, and you guys received me in and we all enjoyed it and laughed about it. He's dealing with a physical infirmity that is causing a temptation. And I've got something wrote down about that here. Uh, but Paul says, listen, I showed up. Y'all received me as Christ. As even as if I was Christ Jesus, you ought to see me. And he says, where's then uh, this blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record. Here you go. That if it had been possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and had given them to me. Now, now maybe you have a little inclination of what Paul's infirmity of the flesh was. Why do they want to pull out their eyes and give them to him, preacher? So he just got done talking about he had an infirmity in his flesh. And over there in Corinthians, he said that he had besought the Lord three times to take that from him. And the Lord told him no. Seems to me like he had something bad wrong with his eyes. Right. I mean, that, that would just be my guess. I, I, I know Paul doesn't say verbatim, hey, I, I forget the word they call it. It's op, OP something that they try to say that Paul had. 
Uh, and, and I've always, always, always wondered in the back of my mind if it wasn't from that bright shining light at Damascus that inevitably caused that, yeah. because that to me would just be the perfect sovereign grace of God saving the man like that and telling Ananias he's going to suffer all these things for my name, and the very thing that saved him was something that he had problems with in the latter end of his life, and the problem he had in the latter end of his life, he besought the Lord three times to take it, and God turns around and teaches him and says, no, my grace is, I mean, it just to me, it's just a perfect circle. I can't prove that, but to me, it's rather amazing to think about. But he says, listen, y'all would have plucked your eyes out, and you'd have given, uh, given them to me. Uh, yeah, I think I've really skipped a lot of notes, which some of y'all are probably going to amen that, but it is what it is. Uh, verse 15, where's his blessing? This? Yeah, I, I read that. Verse 16, Tina told me I had to listen. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? Now, that's a big verse. See, I'm almost to the end because I've only got notes here to 19, so we're about done here. Uh, am I your enemy because I tell you the truth? And that, that's, a, that's a good question for anybody. If, if, if Ellis comes up and tells me something that's true and, yeah, it hurts a little, is he now my enemy for that? No. Shouldn't be. That's the that's the age we live in. Right. Right. Preacher gets up and lays the hammer down on sin, and somebody gets mad, and they think that preacher is my enemy. They don't say that, but I don't like him. I, I got no use for him. He's hateful. I've had people say it's just like you're following me around everywhere. You ain't got. Come on, get some brains. Yeah. I'm not following you around everywhere you go, <laughs> peeking at you, wondering what it is. You, I ain't got time to do all that. That's the Holy Ghost of God. It goes through a man when he's preaching, and he just lays everything on everybody, Amen. and that's the end of it. He gets on me the same way he does you. Amen and amen. amen. But no one is your enemy because they're telling you the truth tonight. Yep. When someone tells you the truth, as bad as it may hurt, and I understand there's times there's some preachers that tell the truth, but they're very, very hateful and rude and prideful. I mean, we've seen it. We've experienced it. I've been around it. You know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. But at the end of the day, if it's truth, that still doesn't make them your enemy. That's right. They may be jacked up. And all whacked out and stupid and arrogant and all that. Yeah, I, I agree that, that that's a whole other problem. But inevitably, the truth does not it never becomes your enemy in that sense. Amen? Amen? That means even if Charlie despises me, but he says the obvious, hey, Shane, I think you're a little fat. He's not my enemy because of that. He's just telling me the truth. But we live in a generation that hates truth. Yep. That's right. I went over this Sunday night. They hate truth. Yeah. Amen? Amen. Amen. They don't like this book because this book will not leave them alone. It calls them out. It shows them what they are. People cannot stand that tonight. Amen? Amen. Amen. This goes on all platforms, all realms, every <coughs> spectrum. People hate truth tonight. Yep. That's, right. That's why we buy into evolution. That's why we buy into Big Big Bang. That's why we buy into the Chinese virus. That's why we buy into masks and all these things. That's why we buy into that because we hate truth. Right. Nobody will research anything for themselves and say, is what I'm being told truth? Right. We look at 70,000, 150,000, 250 million, 6 billion, whatever the number is, they're all doing it. I need to do it too. Right. That's why people get into false religions. That's why people get into actual cults like Jim Jones. That's why people carry around false Bibles. That's why people fell for all the stuff the government tells us all the time, 24 hours a day. They believe it to be true. Yep. And they're all liars. I got bad news for you. The Bible says every man is a liar. Right. That goes for you, your grandma, your aunt, your uncle, and your kids tonight. They're liars. Yep. Yep. Say, not my kids. Well, borrow mine for a couple weeks. <laughs> they will lie to you. Amen? They will lie to you. And if you're, here I am again being political. I know God forbid a preacher have a political opinion. But if you're willing to believe the government cares about you, you got... You need to be in a old yeah. psych ward or something. Yeah. Right. There's something mentally wrong with you yeah. if you believe the government actually cares about you. Right. That goes for both sides. Yeah. Amen. 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 There's one side I'm going to lean towards, but I don't trust them any further than I can throw them. Yeah. Right. Because it seems like as time goes on, my wallet gets thinner and thinner, and theirs gets bigger and bigger no matter who's in there. So that's where you got to just, what do I do, preacher? I don't know what to do. Right here. Yeah. Tim, right. Amen. Tim, quit worrying about left wing, right wing, both attached to the same buzzer type stuff. Just quit worrying about that stuff. Make your decision for you and your family. Do the best you can to serve God. Follow God. Grow in God. Raise your children up in the admonition and the ways of the Lord Jesus Christ. And make your own decisions for your own family because this is still America. I don't give a rip what they say. As of now, we can still choose to do with our families what we want and raise our kids how we want. Whatever your choice tonight, you are an American. You get to do that. Yep. Amen. So your only call tonight is to do it by what his word says. Yes. 
Right. And off and into hell with what the government does. Because right. they ain't interested in growing you closer to God. I got bad news for you. They're not interested in that. Right. You might have one politician here and there, very few and far between, that actually believe this book. I couldn't tell you anymore. I don't pay enough attention. It doesn't matter to me. I'm glory bound with a hammer down, and I ain't worried about Trump or Biden or anybody to get me there. Yeah. And it's obvious if you're relying on the one we got now to get you there, you trip and stumble and fall 40 times before you got there. I'd rather go on the one who can get me there safe and sound without a bump or a bruise. Amen? Amen. Amen. Imagine Biden riding you to heaven on a bicycle. <laughs> that don't get no better than that. I better shut up or somebody's going to get their feelings hurt or mad at me, I'm sure. Hope we're all in good company tonight. But I'm sorry, they're idiots. Christ is Lord and He is perfect and infallible and holy and righteous. And that's who I'm leaning on tonight. And that's who I'm trusting in. Amen. 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 I love this nation, but if we don't stop it, it's going to be in ruins. Yep. I, personally, I, I, I hate saying this stuff because I feel like people just think you're anti-American. But I think America's already in ruins. Right. I, I really do. I, I love our freedom. I'm so thankful for those that died and shed blood so we can have it. But let me tell you something. I got no use for these people that want to trample on the blood of soldiers and spit in their face yep. for the stuff they was willing to lay down their life for so they could have the freedom to do that yeah. stuff. I got no right. use for it. America's in ruins. Yep. We've kicked God out. We've kicked the book out. Yep. You know what's left? Keep the promises what they gave. Would say they would get the serving country. Nope. You don't even want to know, Miss Kay, what I'd do if I was president. <coughs> Y'all probably vote me out of here as pastor real quick. <laughs> it wouldn't be good. You have to deal with it day after day, and it's just, you know, uh, I don't, it's just all the shut up. <laughs> it makes me mad when, I, when you have to look at your husband yeah. and have to go through things and jump through hoops to get the care that he needs. Right. Yep. Don't forget she works for the government. Yeah. And I'll throw that government out as quick as it wants to be thrown out, too. Yeah. We'll throw them out real quick. Whatever comes between me and the Lord, that government can hit the road, too. I don't, don't matter to me. He spent 20 years in the Army and served this country, and then you can't get the health care that you need. That's because they don't care. Yeah, that's so I mean, that ought to be enough to tell you. If they don't care about the ones that even fought to give them the freedom they got now, yeah. what makes you think they care about you? Right. It's, it's just common sense. Now, I'm sure there are some, don't twist my words, I'm sure there's some people that start out with good intentions and want to make a change. I'm not saying they're all that way, but I'm telling you, as a whole, it's done. Right. It's done. If, if, if God is not going to be the center of it, and God, it's done. If, if for you as a Christian, now if you're just like the world and you live like the world and act like the world and try to be a Christian chameleon, which isn't possible, and blend in and do everything the world does, then it probably going to affect you much. Right. Right. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, that time's winding down if you believe this book. You don't believe that? That's between you and the Lord. More power to you. Enjoy it. But like Brother Gary's favorite saying, we're from the government we're here to help. That's the scariest word you ever hear in your life. Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Best words I ever heard was, "I'm the Lord. I'm the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm here to help." That, that's the one I yeah, I'm here to save you. Uh, I'm, where we at? Seventeen. Well, I'm, no, I'm in on time. Uh, yeah, I'm only eight minutes after you. all just calm down for a second, because I got a question for you. Paul's got a bad thorn in his flesh, does he not? Yes. I never. I mean, I've read this a million times, and all the picking I do at the Charismatics, I forgot about this one. But if Paul's got this thorn in his flesh, all the, is anyone who Paul carried with him the whole time his whole ministry? Luke? Yeah. What was Luke? The beloved physician? Yeah. Okay. I, when you get over to 2 Timothy 4.20, Paul says something too interesting there I've never even really thought about. He said he left Trophimus sick at Miletum. So I'm, I'm just asking you. I don't know. I'm just a dumb redneck. But for a man that can heal all these people or could at one time, how come in the latter end of his ministry, he's leaving people behind that are sick? Right. And he's got Luke with him, and he's got all these other apostles around him, and he's got this infirmity they came from. Why is that? I'm just asking you. Have you got knowledge of that? See, you know my teaching, apostolic signs and wonders, that was a short time there that was just for the apostles, and those things have dwindled down. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I, God, still, God still heals people. Right. Yeah. Amen. Amen. He does. Like I said a hundred times, I believe in, I don't believe in healers, but I believe in healing. Yes. I believe God will heal people, but that whole apostolic stuff, 
I'd encourage you to study, but just something to remember, Paul had this infirmity this whole time. He's got Luke a physician. Why do he carry a physician around with him all the time? What do you need a physician with you for if you can heal somebody? Right. Amen? Amen. And then you go there to 2 Timothy 4.20, and, and Timothy, you're getting in the ladder into Paul, and he says, you know, I've left Trophim the sick and Miletum. Why do you leave somebody over there sick, Paul? You've got the apostolic signs and wonders. Or could it be that those were, had wore off? Yeah. Things were coming down winding down to an end there. Amen and amen. You may not agree with that, but just food for thought, and if you can explain it to me, help me out there. Uh, verse 16, 17, they zealously affect you. We're going to end with these two verses tonight because I, I knew I wasn't going to make it. They zealously affect you, but not well, yea. They would exclude you that you might affect them, but it is good to be zealously affected always in a, what's that say? Good. In a good thing. And not only when I'm present with you. So Paul winds up here talking about this. You got some people that are trying to affect you. They're trying to, what, what are the people trying to do? Get them back into bondage. bondage yeah. Yeah. They're trying to zealously affect you. They're trying to drag you back into something that you don't have to be a part of and God saved you from and you're called out of. You're set apart. It's different now. Amen. You, you, you don't have to go back to that. And he says they're, zealous, they're, they're trying to zealously affect you, but not well. So sometimes when people are trying to zealous, zealously affect you, you need to understand sometimes it may be the case that it's not well. It's not a good thing to be affected of. Amen and amen. 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 But not well, yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. But look what he says. But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing. Amen. So if you're going to be zealous, be zealous in a good thing. Right. Here, here's my end thoughts tonight. They affect you. Uh, I want to bring you back under the law. And then I, I, I read this too, and I'm, I'm taking it. Cheerleaders, they zealously affect people. Yeah. That's what they do. Yeah. They're not. They get out there, they cheer, they stomp, they get the crowd fired up, and I mean, they're zealously affecting people. Amen? Right. Amen. Now, this work starts getting rough, because some of the most zealous people you ever met in your life are sports fans. Amen? Amen. If you like sports, I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm just telling you, from my experience, some of the most zealous people you ever meet in your life are sports fans. They will scream their head off like they know tomorrow. They will scream till their horse, scream till their eyes hurt, scream till their throats bleed, go to church or go to go to a ball game and act like a Comanche Indian and come to church and sit like a wooden Indian and pray. They'll go do that stuff. They're zealously affected in something. And yeah, there may not be nothing wrong with sports, but there's something wrong with a man who can scream in a ball game and not get excited about the Lord. Right? Right. And not get fired up about the Lord. And I'll deal with that a little bit more in depth so you understand what I'm talking about. Uh, but, but sports fans, rain, shine, snow, cold, hot, it don't matter. That's right. yeah. That's right. Look, I'm sure all y'all seen the meme that went around. It's, it always goes around, but it's got people sitting in football stadium and the snow, snow is like covered them yeah. and, and they're just sitting there to watch these men that's done nothing for them. Right. I mean, you, you you really want my opinion on the NFL? You probably don't, but they're a bunch of communist brats. Yeah. 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 Call them Kaepernick, top of the list. Yeah. Oh, trying to do my best, but better be glad I ain't president. <laughs> amen and amen. amen. Uh, but rain, shine, snow, cold, hot, it doesn't matter. They will do everything they can to sit and watch that game. Right. Amen? amen? They will. And they stay up late when they got to go to work the next day. Yeah. A lot of football games are on Sunday. If you live very far away from Kansas City, and I'm just picking on them because that's in our state closest to us, they drive up there, and you got another four-hour drive. I mean, it's late before you get home. You'll do that. You're going to say, i got to work the next day, and I'll just be too tired, so I'm going to stay in tonight. Now, brethren, you'll drive, you'll go. These people will do everything they can to get to that game. They will spend every dime they can to get to that game. They will spend <laughs> money to get to the game. They will spend money while they're at the game. Are you getting a correlation of making here? Yep. They'll do whatever they can to make sure they get to that game, make sure they watch that game, and make sure they spend some money on that game. And you can get five of those people. I would, I would guarantee you at least five. It's probably way more than that. But five of them to weep over someone going to hell. You can't get them to be excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't get them to get fired up when someone gets saved. You can't get them to wit. I mean, if this is the world we live in. Right. We're dealing with Paul warning the Galatians about being zeal being affected by people that's being zealous to affect them in a not not a good thing. And Paul turning around telling them it's good to be zealously affected in a good thing. Right. And I'm trying to I'm trying to show you the two. If you like to watch sports, I'm not condemning you. I'm not saying that. 
I'm giving you an illustration here by saying there are people out there that will do anything they can for a sports game and can give a flip less about God and the things of God. And that's a good, clear illustration tonight of being affected over a not-so-good thing versus being not being affected over something you should be affected because it's a good thing. You know? Plain and simple. You want to watch football, watch it till you're blue in the face. It don't matter to me, but I'm saying if you can't get fired up about God, but you can scream and yell and holler at your TV, scream and holler and yell at people running on the field, slapping each other on the hind end, saying good game, surely to goodness, surely to goodness, we can get excited about the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You, you, you want me to pick on something different? Not price is right. <laughs> people scream their head off for winning a bunch of trash, a bunch of furniture that's going to break down. I just shared this here a while back. Lady screaming her mind and out of her mind and screaming her lungs out because she wanted a dishwasher. You and I know just as good as anybody else how long a dishwasher lasts in Polk County. What are you screaming about? Two weeks later you're going to be ticked off because it ain't working. It's lined up and broken and trash. Amen and amen. amen. Then you come to church and just sit there like you ain't got nothing to be excited about. Yeah. It's supposed to be heaven bound with a hammer down. God ripped you out of hell. Yep. God saved your soul. Yep. God's working on you. Yep. He's dealing with you. He's doing all kinds of things and you can't get excited about that. Amen. Amen. And amen. 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 I read another illustration where someone said some women could walk down to the dance hall and dance till 2 a.m. until they had blisters on their feet but couldn't walk five blocks in the prayer meeting. That about sums it up, modern Christianity. You know, yep. Always got something. Always got something more important to do. Always got something more important to do. Listen, brethren, it really don't make no matter to me one way or the other, but what I'm telling you is, is God's going to require to me. He's going to require of you. Yep. And the Bible says redeem the time because the days are evil. We better start getting about God's business yep. and we better start being serious about it. But at the end of the day, it boils down to this, brethren. You're saved by the blood of Christ or you ain't saved at all. Amen. You're not saved by works. Yep. You're not saved by keeping the law. Right. You're not saved by doing good. Amen. That's not what gets you into heaven tonight. Right. What gets you into heaven is what happened right there in Calvary. Amen. Amen. Talking about the hill a little over 2,000 years ago. And that is the Preach Son it. of God stretched out, Amen. dying for your Amen. sins. Amen. Your Amen. sins, not his. Amen. 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 I'll let you all go on that one unless anybody's got something they want to say. I'll do my best to finish up next week that chapter and jump into five. I've done pulled the Jeremy, man. We're going to be... <laughs> Here he's been in Ezekiel for 47 years and the church has been around for 10 years. You have to that to me. <laughs> but it's been good. 